Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Shaw and I'm the Vice President of OneStop. We often receive questions from customers asking what stabilizer is best to use for different fabrics, especially when working with the most challenging fabric out there, 100% polyester activewear. So we partnered with our friends at Ganold and are pleased to have Bill Garvin from BG Tech Services here with us today. Some of you may recall Bill as a speaker at our past expo events, and he always brings a wealth of knowledge to the table about all things embroidery. Bill is here to share his knowledge, provide guidance on choosing the best backing, and hopefully give you the answers you need for your jobs. At the end of this webinar, there will be time for Q&A to be sure we cover all your questions today. And this webinar will be recorded and provided to all our attendees so you can share it with others who you feel can benefit from this information or to come back to it for a quick refresher anytime you need it. Thank you once again for joining us today and thank you for choosing One Stop as your supplier for blank apparel and decoration supplies. Enjoy. Unmute camera. Hi everyone, Bill Garvin here. Uh, thank you for joining the live webinar today. Um, I'm just getting ready to start the uh, presentation. Um, what we're going to be covering here is uh, backing basics, uh, how to pick the right backing for the right job. Um, the two primary backings in the industry, of course, are cutaway versus the tearaway type of backing um, and understanding the right, uh, the right backing choice for the right material when you do um, your embroidery. Um, so again, I'm Bill Garvin. I'm the owner of uh, BG Tech Services. Um, what our company primarily does is service machines as well as education, install new equipment, um, things like that. We're primarily based out of uh, Tampa, Florida, uh, but we do handle most of the East Coast and have customers dotted all around the country and even the Caribbean. Um, so this is going to be, sorry, I'm going to back up one more time here. This is sponsored by One Stop, um, America's best supplier and Ganold, um, everything you need to succeed. Um, this is a live event, so there will be uh, plenty of bloopers and stuff for your uh, viewing entertainment and amusement. Um, so this is not the normal venue that I normally do. I love teaching at the uh, national conferences and do small event classes around the country, uh, even all the way up into Canada. I love doing the the face to face with people, more interaction and testing. Of course, we're coming coming to the end of the COVID. Thank God. Um, hope everybody out there is uh, safe and doing well. Um, Please uh, don't forget, you can ask your questions in the comments. Uh, we have a couple of administrators uh, on hand right now to answer pretty much any question um, that you have. Um, you know, let us know how you're doing. Um, how's business going? You know, let us know if you're safe. You know, give us a location where you're at, where you're working from, you know, things like that. Uh, there will be some door prizes and stuff at the end of this. So, you know, if you, you comment and ask some questions, there's probably a better, better chance that you might be one of those winners. Um, so choosing the right backing, um, it's not just for the embroidery results, um, as far as the hooping and the sewing process when you're running the job. You also have to think about the wearability and washability of the garments. When you see the customer a month from now, two months from now, you want your embroidery to look as crisp and clean as possible, like it was the day that you uh, created it. Um, testing your stabilizers. If you're not sure, if you're testing a new stabilizer, a new product or something like that, make sure you go through the laundering process. See how it holds up after wear and tear, washing and laundering. Test for sensitivity, for example, heat and ironing. Even though we pretty much live in a wash and wear society, I don't think too many people actually iron um, anymore. Um, there's two major types of stabilizer in our industry. There is the cutaway backing and there is the tear away backing. Uh, pretty self-explanatory. One, you're going to need a pair of scissors. Um, the other, you simply grab and tear away with your fingers. Um, tear away is, you know, a lot easier to remove. Um, it's definitely a lot faster as far as your cleanup and stuff during the production process. Um, but stability-wise, that's why backing is called stabilizer. Um, the number one in the industry is always pretty much going to be the cutaway because we're dealing most of the time with wearable apparel. Um, from there, uh, tear away facts. 
Tearaway works for stable materials, meaning it has very little to no stretch whatsoever. Uh, it can be torn away from the edges of the embroidery. Okay. There's two types of tearaway backing. There's considered what's firm, and then the other is considered what is crisp. Uh, the perfect example of the crisp um, tearaway backing that everybody pretty much uses if you run hats. Um, if you run hats in the embroidery industry, you're going to be using what's called referred to as cap backing. Um, my personal preference is a three to 3.6 ounce. This can be purchased in rolls, pre-cut sheets, things like that. Um, I prefer the longer pre-cuts and like the 15 or 16 inch and the four inch wide, uh, simply because if I do want to sew the sides of my caps in your 270 frames, I've got the right size backing needed to do that job without taping or putting pieces together or guessing the length off of a roll. Um, and most of the time, if you're only sewing the front, you just clip, you know, a bundle with a pair of scissors and you got double your backing right there, you know, at seven to eight inches for the front of all of your hats. But again, it's the perfect example of a crisp backing as it, it'll break away as it starts to embroider. Um, and you can see that in the example there on the screen. There is simply more cellulose inside of this and less of the polyester fibers. Um, the next type of backing is the soft, okay? Now this one, when you tear it away, you'll see it appears to be more fuzzy, okay? It does hold up a little better as far as keeping the registration and things on items that are, are, are stable, but, you know, still on the thin side of material. A good example of like that would be like a nylon wind jacket. Um, it's a very thin material. Um, you know, um, it, and it has little to no stretch to it, but because of the thinness, it still wants to pucker and pull on you a little bit more. So that would be a good example. Um, things like umbrellas, if you're embroidering with the tearaway backing, you may want to use the soft instead of the crisp just to hold the registration a little bit better. Um, industry standard wise, I usually find usually between the 1.8 ounce to the two ounce backing works pretty well, uh, for your, for your, um, soft tearaway backing. Okay. Now, tearaway fabric examples um, would be denim shirts, Oxford shirts, towels, polyester jackets, nylon jackets, uh, pretty much any type of tote bag or backpacks, whether it's nylon backpacks, canvas tote bags, you know, things like that, things that are completely stable that when you embroider them, there would be very little to no give or pull or puckering, push or pull whatsoever in the embroidery. Now, talking about the towels as well, that's also another thing that I prefer to use the crisp backing on. If you think about the nap of the materials when you're doing the towels and you're taking off the excess backing from the back and tearing it off and trying to get out the little pieces between like text and things like that, you don't want to have to be picking at the towel and pulling the strands of the towel out. So again, doing on the towel, I would usually prefer the crisp crisp style backing so it breaks away during the embroidery process, but more importantly, it's very easy to remove. Okay. Now, facts about cutaway. Um, you're going to use cutaway on any type of material that is stretchy in any way, shape, or form. It remains permanently with the embroidery even after wash and wear. Um, you're going to, if you try to use tear away on most of the materials, and this is pretty much like any polo shirt, and we're talking whether it's polyester or cotton or 100% cotton or cotton blends, you're going to want to primarily use your cutaway uh, backing. Now, industry standard wise, I talk about industry standards a lot when I do my seminars. The industry standard is pretty much a 2.5 ounce cut away. Now, just over the years of doing embroidery, I've been in the industry now for 29 years. I've had the benefit of running production on machines for nine years, working for machine distributors for nine years and running my own service and education company for the last 11 years. Um, what I have found that most of the time on the two and a half ounce, majority of everything I would embroider, other than just doing the small personalization stuff on left chest and sleeves, most of the time what I'm doing is two sheets of this backing and for two primary reasons. One is it's not just about how good does the embroidery look today when you embroider it and you hand it to the customer. How does it look when you see them in a restaurant two months from now 
You know, they wear that shirt every week. It gets washed every single week. And the last thing you want to see as a business owner and operator is your embroidery that looks all puckered or wavy or cupped up to the point where you can't even read what it's saying. So I've always concerned myself not with just how it looks today in production and handing it to somebody. Concern yourself also about the wearability and washability of that garment holding up over time because anything embroidered well will outlast anything that you ever embroider it on okay so keep that in mind and that's just a personal preference of mine um the other reason for that too is you know to air is human we all make mistakes and if you're using for example a nice peggy stitch eraser to remove those mistakes it is much easier to remove stitches with two pieces of backing than it is with one piece of backing far less chance of damaging any part of the garment when you're doing that. Um, cutaway fabric examples, fleece jackets, blankets, t-shirts, golf shirts, and knits, pretty much anything that has any stretch to it whatsoever. Um, this is available in different weights. It is available in different um, combinations. The most standard in the industry that I find in most of the shops we go to, and me and my guys service on average between 60 to 80 clients per month. Um, most everybody has a pretty nice or decent hooping station for consistency and speed of hooping. Um, and eight by eight pre-cut sheets, bundles of 500, pretty much seems to be the industry standard of what people go by. You always do need the rolls because sometimes you do need to use the larger hoops. Um, but for the most part, I find the industry standard is the 8x8. That is the size that fits almost all of the hooping devices out there that you're using in production inside of your shops. Okay. And now the most frequent asked questions about uh, backing. Okay. And this is a presentation that I literally do an entire seminar on that we're just going to touch base on here real quick. Okay. And what type of stabilizer do you use for your polyester and active wear shirts to prevent puckering? Okay. And the answer is action back stabilizer. Um, it's a highly effective woven backing. It's designed specifically for stretchy materials and garments. So that's our 100% polyester shirts, which are by far the most popular made nowadays, the most number one sold. Every brand, every manufacturer has them out there. Um, it's a completely stable material in both directions, up and down and left and right. Uh, prevents puckering and pooching of the material. Not, not 100%, there is other factors involved that we're gonna to touch base on here in just a minute. Um, it's recommended for solid designs. Again, thin stretchy knit materials, moisture wicking, technical fabrics, multi-directional st stretch materials. Um, also keep in mind that your polyester shirts come in a lot of different uh, patterns as well as weights. And I do find that most of the time, the thinner um, the material is, the more prone to puckering that it becomes. Um, just a side note, um, most of the time you only need one sheet of the action back material. So here's showing you an example of the exact same logo sewed on the exact same shirt at the exact same period of time with no adjustments made. Same thread, same bobbin, same needles, same exact logo. One without action back, that's just the 2.5 ounce industry standard and cut away. And the one on the other side you'll see is with the action back. And you can kind of see how much, you can greatly see as a matter of fact, how much less it actually puckers. Now, something to note here seeing this is if you notice how much worse it puckers on the top of this logo than it does on the bottom. And we're going to touch base on that in just a second. It has to do with the type of stitch that we are dealing with. Um, and again, most of the time recommended is one sheet. Um, sometimes if you want to reduce a little more puckering, I personally do like to use two sheets, one crossed at a 45 degree angle. Not right or wrong. Um, I even had a customer here recently that was having some issues on literally the exact same type of shirt I'm wearing now, a Columbia fishing shirt. Um, it's a stable material, but extremely thin. Um, and she used the action back and she created what I refer to as a backing sandwich. It was uh, two layers of action back in the middle was a piece of 2.5 ounce cutaway. 
Now, keep in mind, she was sewing a logo that was like 16,000 stitches on above the pocket of one of these shirts. So at that point, that, that much embroidery and backing weighs almost as much as these shirts do because it's so lightweight and thin. But she sent me a picture and she said they came out absolutely beautiful doing that. Now, even though she loves her, her magnetic hoops that she uses nonstop, I also recommended that she use her conventional hoops that came with her machine. Um, and the 18 centimeter round, which almost everybody has those out there, because keep in mind the round hoops hold completely 360 degrees all the way around in a perfect circle. So just a little hint there, of a couple of things that you could try that could also reduce the puckering a little bit. Um, another option is referred to as poly mesh. Um, this also is, is a backing that is designed um, to reduce the puckering on your stretchy materials. Um, the number one thing most people use the poly mesh backing on is when a garment is sheer, uh, meaning you can see the backing through the shirt after you've done the embroidery. That is uh, lightweight garments, but see-through garments, whether it's a white, uh, light colors, like a yellow, like an ash gray or something like that. Um, now I've had clients and me personally get in trouble in the past using the poly mesh and not using the poly mesh. Um, so what I do in my seminars is I tell people, don't ever make that decision for your clients, have them make that decision. I've had customers that didn't like how much it puckered with the poly mesh. Um, and when I use the poly mesh, I still add a piece of like tear away behind it just for the added stability during the embroidery process. It is gonna pucker a little more with the wearability and washability. Versus if I was doing like the backing sandwich where I have to cut everything away or conventional backing where you're going to see the backing through the shirt. Now, keep in mind, you are going to cut it as close to the embroidery as possible. So, you know, don't leave a great big square in there. That's kind of obvious. Um, but again, it's not right or wrong. So I usually tell people do a sample with the poly mesh or the soft and sheer no-show backing on one side of a garment. And then on the other side, do the conventional or the cutaway and the action back to help even with more of the puckering issue. And then wash it a couple of times, hang it up and let, let a customer decide. Would they rather have the embroidery hold up a little better or would they rather not see the backing through? Um, usually most of the time, believe it or not, they usually don't mind the backing because their business, their life, their livelihood, everything they've invested for decades is the logo itself. And they want it to be as crisp and clean and as nice as possible for as long as they own that garment and for everybody to see it that they physically meet. Uh, more things to know about embroidering these delicate items, your polyester shirts, okay? And a lot of it has to do with the logo. The more stitches and the wider the stitch is, the more it will pull and pucker. All embroidery pulls, all embroidery pushes on all fabrics. So, of course, the thinner and the more stretchy the material, the worse those things are going to happen. Knit and woven polyester fibers can stretch three to four times their actual size. And I know this for a fact because I wear a 3X and I've put on a medium before. It's not pretty. Pretty much had to cut it off with a pair of scissors. But that's how much that material can physically stretch. So think about what it's doing when you're embroidering on it and you're seeing the puckering on the logos. And this comes down to the underlay. So the right backing choice is going to help you out greatly, guys, as far as reducing the puckering on the shirts. Um, the only backing I've really ever saw out there that worked better than the action back is kind of a fusible backing, but you got to make it a permanent fuse. Um, and because of that, you'd literally have to turn shirts inside out, take an eight by eight sheet, hire another full time employee to do nothing but iron the backing onto the back of shirts, turn them back inside out so you're ready for production. And then it stays in there. It will soften over time, but it leaves a big square on the shirt. Um, so for those reasons, I just say that in, in that scenario, you're not boutiquing. You're not ones off with baby bibs and birth cloths and stuff like that, that the fusible backing really works great with. Um, so for that reason, I usually say that fusible is simply not feasible in the commercial embroidery world. Action back is the way to go. Um, but the underlay, we all have a bad habit. Um, you get your software, you learn the basics of it. You really go no further 
you know, keep in mind that 95% of everybody that owns a machine runs a shop that does production embroidery, does no digitizing whatsoever. They leave that to the professionals. It's a setup fee. It's a one-time process. I ask people all the time, you know, how much should you pay for a digitized logo? I know you can get it for $5. I know you can get it for $10. You know, personally, I, I don't charge anybody that cheap um, whatsoever. But the answer is, it doesn't matter what you pay for a logo. It's only got to be paid for one time and one time only. Okay. The rule of digitizing is simple. Create a design to sew as efficiently as possible and freaking look good. Okay. Other than that, it doesn't matter what you pay for it. Think about how many logos you have right now you've sewed over the last 10 years that every time the customer comes in, you start sewing and you know it's going to be a nightmare. Truth is, pay to have it redigitized because if whatever you were sewing yesterday ran like a dream, you know there's nothing wrong with your equipment. You know there's nothing wrong with your hooping ability or your backing choice. You know the problem is the logo. So stop fighting the problem and fix it. And how much should it cost? It doesn't matter if it solves your problem, right? You will recoup whatever that cost is over time, probably the next time you do any production run on the job, even if it's only six pieces, okay? But back to the software, when you're doing your underlay choices, um, believe it or not, most of us fall into a really bad habit. And that bad habit is you just accept the underlay the software gives you and you go so production because the one thing we all have to be really good at, okay, is text. That's the personalization. You send your logo out for the left chest. It's beautiful. You need to do 100 pieces. But out of those 100 pieces, there's 20 employees and each shirt, each, every five shirts gets a different name. You ever notice that you're hooping well, the right backing choice, the puckering is far less on a 10,000 stitch logo than a three quarter inch name bill on the right chest of the exact same shirt and you're hooping the same, the right backing choices. Um, and you're like, why is it doing this? I usually ask people this in the seminars and they'll be like, you know, everybody will dance around the question, the, the right answer. And the answer is it's the width of the stitch. The wider the satin stitch is, the more it pulls in left to right. Therefore, the more it will pucker. So when you accept the default underlay on satin stitches, zigzag or columns, they can be called different things in different softwares. Keep in mind that the default underlay is almost always going to be a zigzag or a double zigzag. And for that reason, that is simply adding more satin stitches to the logo that are wide, creating it, making it pucker even more. Okay. So if you think about it, Start practicing and learning the different techniques with your underlay. For example, just changing from a zigzag, the most affected I, effective I have seen is an edge walk with a parallel underlay. Um, if you have Wilcom software, for example, it would be called a tatami instead of a parallel underlay. Almost all of them refer to as an edge walk um, and a short stitch length around two millimeters. Um, if you understand what underlay is in digitizing, it is simple. It entire job in life is to tack the decorated apparel to the stabilizer to reduce the amount of push and pull during the embroidery process on top. So think about what I just said, to reduce the amount of push and pull. So if you're doing a zigzag, or double zigzag on that text, just doing names on the left chest of 100% polyester shirts, it already is pulling, already pulling on the underlay, and then it's going to pull more because of the higher density when it does the satin stitch over the top of it. Um, even going to a simple basic center walk underlay will pull less than having the zigzag or the double zigzag underlay. OK, so there's a couple of examples you can see of just me embroidering inside of a hoop uh, with a center walk underlay and then doing a uh, tatami underlay with an edge walk underlay, for example. And think about what it's doing. Very short stitch lengths, making that material a lot more stable, 
therefore greatly reducing the amount that that satin stitch can pull the material in on top of that backing as it embroiders left to right, left to right. Um, all satin stitches are two penetration points of a needle, left, right, left, right. When I teach a digitizing class, I refer to it as the, the military tool um, because you create it the exact same way it sews. Left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, and it is the hardest tool to master. Fills are easy. It's just an outline, put holes in it if you want to. Run stitches are easy. It's a single strand of thread. And just FYI, that is all the stitches that exist in embroidery. There's a run, a satin, and a fill. Learning how to put them in the right order and efficiently reducing the amount of trims and stops in a logo is how to make a design uh, more effective and more cost effective as far as reducing time. Okay, hooping do's and don'ts. Uh, hooping is simple. If you're in commercial business and you're doing apparel, you're going to hoop the same for 100% PK knit shirts as you are 100% polyester shirts to leotards, to tutus, to fleece, to anything else. Make sure that the material is as taut as the backing, okay, but do not stretch it. All right. Do not stretch the material because that will just simply increase the puckering. Um, a couple of tests that people will do is called a pinch or a roll test. So if you're spot checking employees or yourself when you're doing your hooping, after hooping, make sure it's tight. Make sure it's a drum effect so you can tap on the back of that and it will not come loose on you. OK. And the two test is called a pinch or a roll test. And what that is, is pinch the material with two fingers lightly inside the hoop. The material should not pinch up underneath your fingers. The other is the roll test. Just roll your finger lightly from one side of the hoop to the other um, and make sure the material doesn't roll. Um, if it does either of those two things, the material is still too loose on top of the backing. And if that's one shirt out of four on a forehead, that one is going to pucker more. Uh, anytime you get to a four, six, 12 head machine, consistency is the name of the game, especially when it comes to hats. Um, always make sure that the stabilizer covers the entire hoop. Do not leave part of it exposed um, and never float pieces of backing underneath. Um, there is maybe some boutiquing projects or something that you could do that with, but not in the commercial embroidery world. Um, and do me a favor too. I go into a lot of shops. Do not have 12 boxes of scrap cutaway laying around under the table for maybe future use. Um, that's referred to as hoarding and a fire hazard. Um, once you cut it away, it is scrap. It goes in the trash. Get your next piece out and keep making money. Okay, hooping and sewing, make money. Machines make money, it's called an ATM. Machines just sitting there humming, it's called a boat anchor, a really expensive boat anchor. Okay. Now, there's a couple of webinar specials going on today, guys. Um, as far as one stop, um, all Ganold products that they carry will be 10% off. Uh, this is valid until the end uh, of this month. Um, just use the, Ganold, the, the code that you see there, which is Ganold10. Um, they also have a couple of um, giveaways that they're doing. The first one, door prize, is going to be a 250-piece bundle of action back. Um, that is the pre-cut 8x8. Eight eight. Uh, that's a $65 value. Now, One Stop will be notifying the people um, that won this. Um, and if you didn't attend, I can pretty much tell you you probably didn't win. Um, but they'll be reaching out to you for that. Uh, the second door prize is going to be the Ganold Toolkit. Um, this is one of my favorite things. And the reason being, as a technician, Inside my tool bag, I have one of these toolkits. So whether I'm setting up a machine, servicing machine, um, when I'm done with the service, I'm done with the setup and I'm ready to test, this is the only thing I need. The, the screwdriver is the perfect size, not only to change my needles, but also to adjust my bobbin case. Um, it's got two great pairs of snips and scissors in there, as well as the sharp tweezers that are awesome when doing 3D puff. OK, uh, for some reason, there's a seam ripper. Um, I don't even know if this generation knows what a seam ripper is. Um, I personally never used one, but it's in there if you ever need it. OK, um, hopefully y'all been posting some questions, um, you know, getting some answers. Um, again, the easiest way to contact me is my website. It's uh, bgtechservices.net. Um, I respond easier and quicker when it comes to uh, emails. No. 
Those, somebody's asking if I see questions on the screen. I'm like, nope, I don't see anything. Okay. Nope, that's it. But if you have any any questions, machine wise or anything like that, then you know, feel free to contact me. Information is always free. Um, other than that, um, thanks for attending. Don't be a scaredy cat. Meow. They bet that I wouldn't do that. Right. Uh, now that you have the facts that you need to pick the right backing choices and the right job. Yes. Somebody has a question, apparently. Uh, yeah, absolutely. She asked if I want to answer some questions. So I will do my best. Okay. All right. Sonia wants to know, and what was the way the cutaway that you recommended? Okay, Sonia wanted to know what was the weight of the cutaway that I recommended. Um, my personal preference is the 2.5 ounce uh, cutaway. Um, and again, almost everything I embroider in my preference is two sheets. Again, it's about the washability and wearability. That was her other question. Does it matter how thick the backing is as to whether you use two pieces? Yep. So she was asking, you know, same question, same how song. thick the backing is. Same Sonia. So no, what it has to do usually is stitch count. I have personally, for example, done a police badge logo before that was four inches in height, over 20,000 stitches. And even on a PK knit shirt for it to look the best, I actually used three sheets of 2.5 ounce cutaway backing. Um, these were men's very large shirts, so the logo worked out great, but it was still the 100% the PK knits were so soft, that many stitches in that four inch area was wanting to cup on me. Um, so, and I, to, to avoid that, I used three pieces of that 2.5 ounce cutaway, and it, it definitely helped solve my problem. Here's another. How many pieces of backing for non structured hats? Very good question. So, somebody asked who asked that? Sonia. Sonia again. Sonia's got a lot of questions. Apparently, Sonia's going to be winning a door prize. <laughs> I see this in her future. So that's a very good question. She wanted to know how many pieces of backing when embroidering your caps. Um, now, most of the time, for example, the most popular hat out there is, of course, like a Richardson 112. There's a lot of generics that are selling like hotcakes right now because Richardson and supply chain everywhere is so disrupted around the globe that it's it's hard to get some of your favorite items and things right now. Most of the time, I'm always going to use one piece of my three or 3.5 ounce uh, cap backing, which is, again, it's, it's the crisp backing. Um, however, what most people don't do is this, is when you're doing an unstructured hat, keep in mind what backing is. It's stabilizer. An unstructured hat's completely floppy in all six panels, so it's not very stable. And keep in mind that hats only hoop on one side versus hoops that hoop all the way around. So tight and consistent. Make sure you understand how to adjust your cap frames so that you can hoop tight enough. But on unstructured hats, I always use two pieces of that cap backing. You know, if it's a really thin, cheap hat, like a, a structured hat, like a a painter's cap, the real inexpensive one, like your cost is under a dollar. Um, a word of advice, tear away one piece of that backing at a time and don't try to rip two because it's still strong enough. You may rip the hat apart. Um, and since I'm on the subject and she asked the question, um, a lot of people now will embroider the Nike hats. These are the polyester, the, the uh, moisture management wicking hats. Uh, again, same scenario, so thin, so stretchy. Get your frame adjusted as tight as physically possible. Even using a trick of like the cardboard that comes in hats or an additional piece of backing folded in half where the teeth come around the straps to give additional thickness for the tightness. But I always use two pieces of the cap backing on those hats. Now, also another industry standard, 7511 ballpoint needles. Okay, a standard needle in the industry is a DB times K5, 7511 ballpoint. Um, on the thicker structured hats, you may have sometimes have a little better luck with the sharp needles. Sometimes you might need to go up to an 8012. My personal preference is a 7511 ballpoint because I learned a long time ago whether a hat would sew or not, 95% of it is in the digitizing. If you, you see creases, you see folds in a hat, stop. You're just, you're fighting an uphill battle. Um, you're trying to go up the stream and you have no oars whatsoever. It's only going to get worse. If you're constantly breaking needles, stop. 
because you're just going to cause more physical damage to your machine. Have the logo looked at, have it redone. Stop, run a sample flat. You know it's not your equipment. You know it's not the machine. Um, so, you know, keep those things. Oh, wait a minute. I'm in the service industry. Never mind. Do do all that good stuff. <laughs> it's great for business. <laughs> My business, not yours. <laughs> Call me when it breaks down. But no, seriously. Um, do you have any more questions for me? Yep. One more. Will Richards. Put it, put it up there so everybody can see it, mm -hmm. except for you, Bill. Is it okay to float back and if you add it after it's already running? He's ran into a few issues where a rat's nest and, and, and so he's putting, floating another piece under and reso it. So Will's question was, was it okay? Well, everybody's seen it. So is it okay to float? Um, there is occasions where I have seen starting to run and there's an issue, whether it's starting to bird's nest or something on me. Normally, this would be an issue with a bob intention being a little bit too tight. But if you do have this happening, absolutely, it's okay to slide a piece underneath there. Um, another scenario where it's okay to slide backing underneath is if you're using, for example, your fast frames or your Durky Easy frames. Um, this is where you're using the, the sticky backing. It's called stick and stitch um, to lay the material down over the top. If it's a thinner material and you can't, because it's it's sticky backing and you're just sticking the material down on top of the frame that comes around, there's no way to hoop your conventional backing in. But if it's wanting to pucker too much, there's another scenario where it's okay to float a nice piece of cutaway in underneath the bottom of it once it starts. Um, even making mistakes, taking your Peggy stitch eraser, getting the stitches out, putting it back on the machine, ready to re, re sew over top of that area, I'll do the same thing. I will take a piece of my 2.5 ounce cutaway and slide it under. That way it has something stable where I cut all that material and stuff out of place. All right, so last thing we're gonna cover is the filmoplast. Okay, so that is basically a topping, right? But it can also be used as a backing. Some people will do that on their towels, all the, the filmoplast, sorry, this is the sticky backing. So yeah, the film, filmoplast is probably the number one rating backing in the industry. So what that is used for is for the fast frames and the easy frames that are out there. It is a very low residue, highly adhesive backing, okay, that is, is the stick and stitch. Um, the best part about the filmoplast is no matter how much you use it, it does not gum up your needles. That's what makes it the number one sticky backing in the industry. And again, bloopers, I told you I messed up a little bit. The other one is the is the um, Solvi. So whether it's the Ultra Solvi, you can do patches and stuff on, the standard Solvi, um, this is your topping. So sometimes people don't even realize Solvi can be used on anything. It's not just for towels. It's not just for polar fleece. If you embroider something, even if it's a polyester knit shirt, you're doing small taglines, detailed small columns, and you see that it's not as crisp and clean as you would like it to be, Try sewing the next one with a piece of Solvi and in the hoop, not floated because it'll bunch up um, in the hoop and see if you see a difference as the professional embroiderer. If you see a difference, then guess what? Spend the extra 10 cents, spend the extra time and use the Solvi. It's your reputation on their logo. Okay. One last, um, oh, we got one more question. Um, I just want to say, Will says um, he uses his seam ripper seam ripper every day. It gets where Peggy stitch eraser. Congratulations, Will. Will. And then Cindy has thermo fix specialty backing. Is that an iron on? Sorry, say it again. Is um, thermo fix specialty backing? Is that an iron on? Yes, it is. Backing? Yes, it is. Thermo fix is an iron on backing. OK, um, and even there's a, there's other toppings out there besides that. There's also a heat away type of topping that is out there. Um, and what it's designed for is materials that cannot ever get wet during the embroidery process or after. Um, that's like cashmere and corduroy um, items like that. Any other questions? That is all we see. We have people from Nebraska and Michigan. Excellent. Well, guys, can't thank you enough for attending today. Um, I'm sure this uh, this presentation will be shared over the next coming days and weeks as well. Again, information is always free. Um, you know, reach out to your one-stop sales and, you know, um, 
service staff, and they'd be more than happy to ask you answer any questions as far as the supplies and everything that they sell. Uh, thank them again for allowing us to do uh, this presentation. And remember, guys, the more you know, the better you sell. Enjoy.